everyone, welcome to episode 64 of Pixel Feet Radio, and I'm here with my friend Dom Einhorn. Dom, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you very much. All the way from France. All the way from France. It's pretty late over there right now. It's like 8 p.m. I think I think you said. So uh, it's, good. it's getting there. We're, we're, we're ahead of most of the rest of the world. There you go. I appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you being on uh, uh, this late. I really do. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Dom is the founder and CEO of uh, Unicorn, which is an incubator accelerator, uh, the startup super cup, and he's also an angel investor. So he's pretty deep in the, the whole tech genre there. So I'm sure we're going to have, I'm going to have tons of questions because I love talking about this stuff and where everything's going in the industry. But, um, before we get into all that, why, why don't you tell us about your background? Dom? How did, how did it all start it, man? Were you an entrepreneur as a kid selling stuff on the side? How did it, how did it all start it? Not quite the case. I was born and raised in France where I'm at right now. I'm half French, half German. So I'm Alsatian, for those of you who know what that means, Alsace-Lorraine, northeastern France. Uh, so we're like half-breeds between the French and the German. We're strange individuals as a, as, as a group. Um, in my early 20s, I moved to the U.S., where I spent the quarter century on the West Coast, uh, in Los Angeles in particular, uh, where I had my failures and my successes, more failures than successes, but the uh, few successes made up for all of the failures. I've been in the tech space since 1993, which makes me a dinosaur in that space. Back when I started, there was no search engine. There was a human moderated directory called Yahoo. Uh, it was the only way you could search the web, and it was actually no algorithm. You know, it was actually people feeding links into a directory, human, direct, human directory. I was one of the three people you would find when you typed in online marketing consultants in 1993, 1994. And six months later, I was no longer there. So I uh, had a few exits in the U.S. about three years ago, two and a half years ago, moved back to France. Didn't want to leave uh, Los Angeles to go to Paris. I wanted to go to a smaller town uh, where yeah, I can have enjoy a very nice uh, way of life. I mean, Sala, south of France, southwest, S-A-R-L-A-T, uh, which is a town of 9,000 people and 3 million tourists a year. It's a medieval town. Uh, it's somewhat halfway between Bordeaux on the west side and Toulouse on the south. For those of you who want to look at a map, or you type in Sarla into Google Images, and you'll be you'll be surprised at what you see. That's amazing, man. That's so cool. Uh, I'm sure it's beautiful out there. That's that's interesting. You decided to leave LA for just like a quiet, relaxing type of town. Like I'm the other way around. I like chaos. <laughs> like right now, I just I like had, organized like, chaos. Yeah, organized chaos. Like I I always like lived in like you know big cities and. Uh, I uh, I just had my first kid, so I had to move out of the downtown area because you know you can't raise a kid in the middle of a downtown area. I mean, you could, but it's not. The difference you know? between you and me is you're 127 years younger than me, so that makes sense. Uh, I don't know about that, man. <laughs> I'm getting pretty high up there. I just hit 40, so you know, congratulations. Just, yeah, uh, stuff is breaking down. And, like my shoulder just went out the other day for no reason whatsoever. Uh, you know, I, I still I miss that actually. Like I don't like peace and quiet not yet at least so that's that's super interesting especially you know being in the online you know marketing area from such an early uh time uh and and going through it and being around you know close to san francisco and all that stuff uh but that's very interesting that you bring up the the yahoo deal because i remember uh, i got access to uh, to the internet when i was 13 in 93 or 94 i think it was you know aol uh, that's what made it most remember popular. Back then, we didn't used to call it the internet. We called it the information superhighway. That's so true. Yeah, absolutely. And we started uh, calling it the internet when Netscape 1.0 came around, the first web browser. That's yeah. When everybody so, officially called, because there was no, technically speaking, there was no internet. You had no browser, right? No, so, I didn't. So yeah. I thought, you know, not knowing any better and being a kid, and my my parent had no idea. He just got it because I asked for it. But, um, you know, I thought. AOL was the actual quote unquote internet. And then I come to find out the more I play with it and start talking to friends who, who got access online, we're like, it's like, no, dude, you got to download this thing called Netscape. Like AOL is like a browser. I'm like, and that just blew my mind. And then, you know, once I got access to Netscape, that's when I started seeing like quote unquote the real web. But my first um, search engine that I used was one called the web crawler. Yeah, and I was just about to mention it, which was obviously because that was powering AOL. It was powering AOL searches. AOL owned web crawler at that time. Oh, really? See, I didn't know. That. Yeah. I wouldn't know that. But so I, I started using web crawler. And then my first, well, my second, well, my first 
email address was AOL, of course. But then the second one, you know, that I opened up was on Yahoo. Uh, so I was Yahoo was pretty popular at the time, and then of course, as we both know, Google came around in the corner. And did well, it's I, I lived I lived in uh, Santa Monica, California at that time. My first email address, I'll always remember it. It was Ocean at PacificNet.net, and I nice. lived two block. I lived two blocks from the Santa Monica Pier. That is awesome. So. I mean, I want to know, I've never actually heard of stories from somebody who was actually there at that time. I mean, I was a kid, but you know, the dot-com bubble came in 98, 97, somewhere around there. Like, what was it like to be there? Like, I can just imagine like all of a sudden you get access to the whole world. And it's like, I, I'm the type of person, if I knew what I was doing, if I was that, you know, I would have been like, oh my God, what can I do with this access to everything? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, I think the big difference that you had back then is that the access was not what I would call democratized, right? It was privileged access, first and foremost. It was a lot more expensive, not necessarily to get online, but to do business online than it is today. So a couple of examples. In 1998, my average monthly bandwidth bill was $8,000 US. Oh, my God. And I used, <laughs> here's the kicker. I used 800 times less bandwidth than I'm using today, and today I'm paying nothing, yeah. virtually nothing. In 1999-2000, we launched the first e-commerce websites, and in order to do that, you needed to run a database. At that point in time, you had one choice, or should I say any choice as long as it's Oracle, yeah. and one Oracle server instance would put you back $32,000. Oh so the core difference there is that unless you raised a quarter million to half a million dollars, you, you had no point being in business and you would be eating through that so fast that you really had to generate revenue very, very quickly. And fast forward uh, 20, 25 years later, everything is free or almost free, right? So the whole process has been vastly democratized and demonetized. Uh, what you have today is you have ability to launch a business overnight on your smartphone. Now, the downside of that is everyone in the world can be your competitor overnight as well. So you really have to differentiate yourself differently. That's why actually the money component is less and less important today. What really matters is the ability to obviously have product market fit and to be able to scale it and execute upon that. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of, um, you know, big companies when, when they come to me and they want to, you know, run some... Uh, advertising with Facebook ads and stuff. So it's like, I look at their websites sometimes and it's like, you know, it's like, it's not set up for conversions, man. It's not, you know, it's not 2001, it's not 2003. Like you to stand out, not even to stand out. I mean, you can still traffic from anywhere if you know what you're doing, but you really need to work on your conversion rate. And sometimes just because your website is pretty doesn't mean it's, it's gonna convert, you know? No and it's really hard. Me. It's really hard driving that message sometimes, and it's got it's, a perfect little anecdote that that will illustrate what you just said. In 1996, in Santa Monica, my dad, who knows nothing about internet marketing, was looking over my shoulder. It's like, "What are you trying to do here, son?" I said, uh, "Dad, please leave me alone. I'm, you know, I'm having a hard time because this campaign does not convert." He goes, "Let me tell you something, son. I have no idea what you're trying to convert here. Remember one thing. He's telling me in French. He goes." You can dump up that donkey as much as you want. He's never going to win a horse race. <laughs> and, it, and, and it stuck with me. You can send as much traffic to that landing page as you want. It's never going to convert, right? Right. In this case, he was absolutely right. No matter what it is we tried, we tried another six months. We didn't get any traction for that product because there was no product market fit. And I didn't really know what it meant at that time. Right. I tell, uh, you know, I, I've launched many funnels for myself and I tell people all the time, I'm like, listen, I know what I'm doing. I know what converts and what doesn't convert. And even to this day, it's been a while since I launched a funnel because I'm super focused on e-com. But even sometimes I still have to modify the funnel. And it's like, you know, sometimes I make them look all pretty because I see some something cool out there that I like. And, you know, and and the ugly one wins like 80% of the time. I mean, on, on, that note, <laughs> on that note, on that note, we've done probably upwards of 1,500 campaigns since the mid-90s. Yeah. And there is one mainstay, there is one common theme for all of them. The version of the landing page, the version of the ad campaign that we believe that the onset of the game would perform the highest, never has performed the highest. Thank you. Not once. It's the same for Not me. Once. The same. Yeah. The same. I'm like, how is it that I like, 
you know, this one should be the winner. And I'm looking, I'm like, this one is crushing. But, you know, yeah. you and I both, that you can be emotionally uh, involved with these things. So, of course, once I see the dead, it's like, cut it off. I don't care. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. most people tend to, you know, starting out, they tend to emotionally attach to whatever they've been working on for months or weeks or whatever. And they're like, no, it has to convert. It has to convert. And that's at that point you're gambling because you're not listening to the data. You're giving your money away. Right. Well, you know, the thing is if you're, if you're doing that, if you're ignoring the data, you're obviously you're putting yourself on a path of failure, which is exactly what you want to avoid. In fact, you want to provoke the failure as quickly as possible because that's the cheapest you're going to get. So you quickly iterate, which Facebook ads allows you to do, any app platform allows you to do that, right? Throw a few bucks at it. If it doesn't convert, shut it off immediately. But don't let it run for a month because it's going to burn a hole in your pocket. But a lot of people do that. Absolutely. So when you, uh, when you, when you started getting into it, what, what was the, the first thing that you launched? Was it a store? Was it a personal? Uh... The very first thing that I launched was in 1993, 94, early 95 was the very first online art auction. It actually was, was called at that time, theartauction.com. And what got me into that business is I had a lot of friends that were artists. I'm no artist by any means. And that's the reason why I've always been attracted to them because I can draw a hammer, for example. And when I see beautiful art, I'm still today an avid art collector. And I wanted to help these guys. They were all—they all had one thing in common. They were all starving, including myself. Right. So, <laughs> instead of they had no cash, so they couldn't pay me cash for the campaigns. They paid me in art, uh, which awesome. I still have today. I accumulated a, a large collection, and we actually developed the code for the first online art auction, which at first took a while to take hold because it was all guerrilla marketing strategies. And then at one point in time, a large magazine. Heard about it, came to the report and us, and boom, here we go. 25,000 bidders within a week. And we had 30 artists that just, the, the, even the crappiest stuff literally sold out instantly. And overnight, we were in the art fulfillment business, which we had no idea of. Uh, we didn't know what insurance was. We didn't know how to properly package art. We were selling limited edition prints that with glass, without protecting it right, it would break while it was being shipped. Absolute nightmare. So we tried to resolve that problem. We had a lot of sleepless nights doing it because we just were up until four or five in the morning just shipping out boxes and bringing back the ones that were broken and resending them. And at one point in time, we had an offer from a large company to come in and, you know, got that monkey off my back. Uh, yeah. And I was very, very happy about it. So yeah, I've been there was, a couple of times. <laughs> I was like, I was wondering, I was, I was very young. I thought, look, how can anybody want my failure so bad right now? How can anybody want you know that that headache but they did very well after that and they were mo mostly after our database one uh one of my most successful uh stores when i started out that i sold i realized very quickly that i didn't want it anymore because i started to scale and i scaled hard um and all of a sudden i realized that women tend to buy two or three sizes just to see which one fits best and then they would send the other one the other two back so once I, I scaled really hard and I started getting all the exchanges and the returns, which, you know, it's, you got to deal with it. That's part of the business. I realized yeah. very quickly that I wanted to get out of the apparel world because I just, I didn't have the patience. For well, it's there. funny you mentioned that because I decided after the experience that I will never get, I will never touch a product again in my life. And I haven't since. No, really? I never, I haven't touched a product. Now I've done a lot of campaigns, acquisition campaigns for product-based companies, but Internally, I never ever touched a product again. It was all purely services, uh, all digital services, which was hard at that time. It's a lot easier today, but uh, I, get, I get bitten, I get vaccinated, I guess, uh, <laughs> with, with with the art deal. And yeah. I just turned on. Basically, I still have a lot, actually a lot of a lot of the uh, painters, for example, were older guys, half of which have passed since. But I still have a lot of good friends from those times, uh, and an awful lot of art. Uh, including from three artists that are today listed where the value of the art is 50x or 100x today. That's amazing. So let me ask you something. So back then, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know I keep going up, but I was just so curious of, you know, to talk to somebody who was actually there. So obviously before Google Ads and all that, how will you get, you will build your site that costs you thousands and thousands of dollars. How will you drive traffic to it? Like, huh. that's yeah, the so question. I, you, you're 40, so it was right around the cusp probably that you may or may not remember. Do you remember the old news groups? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. so you remember the news groups which just came, I would say, right after the bulletin boards, the first DOS-based bulletin boards, and then 
uh, you actually had news groups. And at one point in time, you had 15,000 news groups where you could post. But if you posted anything commercial, you literally, they would track you down and they will try to kill you. That's how insane it was. <laughs> anything commercial was so frowned upon that you had haters like you've never seen and you'll never see again, hopefully. In our, like Reddit, in our back in the day. <laughs> so you had you had to be extremely creative about how you positioned yourself. You had to like basically uh, put a wrapper around any kind of veiled commercial messages. And we were actually, you know, it's a lot of copywriting, a lot of hey, can you help me do this because I'm representing this and this artist, right? On the right news groups. So you had to go by way off in order to generate that traffic. But already using those strategies, we were generating between three and 5,000 clicks a day from news groups. Amazing. Once we understood that we needed to stay away from the haters. Uh, and if you if you deviated from that strategy, you'd absolutely get killed, blacklisted forever. They would smear your name on every single other board and there's no way you could ever come out of that box. You would black boxed instantly. But with the strategy that we use, it converted like heck. I mean, it was it, it was amazing because even the most granular interest, say fly fishing in northwestern Montana, had a had a news group. Now, granted, there may have only been three, four hundred people on. It was basically a precursor of podcasts in written format, right? Where you could zero in in a, in a very granular way to very specific interests, knowing that you would have to go lengths to get a commercial message across. That was our primary way of driving traffic. That's amazing. And then shortly thereafter, it became the web crawlers, Alta Vista, Lycos. So you could uh, be creative. And uh, at that point in time, you could still very easily trick a search engine, uh, the algorithm. Uh, I remember one point in time in Alta Vista, we had like, we were number one for 3,000 keywords for like a six month period of time. <laughs> Just by iterating trial, trial and error. Okay, let's do it for 100. Let's do it for 1,000. You know? <laughs> it was really, it was really the Wild West. That's amazing. Um, Alta Vista, I forgot about that one. And Lycos, I forgot about that one too. I used to all of yeah. them, man. That's crazy. That's so cool. Um, so moving forward, obviously you, you uh, founded uh, Unicorn. So let's talk a, a little bit about Unicorn. Obviously makes sense, the background that you have. Uh, I'm always curious about Unicorns because I, I've never actually, I've only talked to a few people uh, that have done it. So I want to get your insight of how the whole process works. So I have an idea for, I don't know, an app or a store or whatever. And the people always ask, it's like, how do I get VC funding? How do I, you know, the way I explain it to people just from, and trust me, I'm no expert in this whatsoever. So I'm just assuming it's like, well, you got to come up with a proven model. Once you have a proven model and you have some traction, then I guess you, you can start reaching out to people. And if you have a plan set, you know, if you can get a meeting and get in front of them, you pitch them. And then if they like the idea, you know, it's it's they'll put money into it. I mean, uh, you know, VCs, it's pretty we have a bankroll like I wouldn't say gambling because they know what, what they're doing. But it's like they have a bankroll and they say out of the 10 companies. Probably eight will fail, and then the two that make it, they're gonna pay up for everything for years to come. Um, so, how did you get into, you know, obviously with the knowledge that you have, what made you, uh, you know, start Unicorn, and and how does that? So people know what is that process like? Yeah. So everything you just said is 100% right, and most importantly, you've just by expressing yourself identified the real problem that exists in the marketplace, the real gap that we intend to fill. And the easiest way to explain that gap, I call it the expectation gap. Startup entrepreneurs are pitching on FM, investors are listening to AM. That kind of like describes the metaphor of what's really going on. When I first started in the business as a startup entrepreneur, I was approached by an investor. He came to see me in my apartment in North Hollywood, California. I was very enthusiastic. I pitched him about my digital media company and his eyes glazed over. He didn't understand a single thing. Right. Then he started speaking up. And the first questions he asked me was, so what are you raising? A seed round, pre-seed round, or series A? And I looked at him the way he looked at me. Like, what is this guy talking about? I have no, sir, I apologize. I have no idea what, that, what any of that means. Now, it's gotten a little better 27, 28 years later, but not so much, where you still have a huge gap on the expectation side between one and the other. So what we did at Unicorn is basically I leveraged my own experience 
20 years of which was as a startup entrepreneur, which I still somewhat am to them, but I primarily, I turned into an angel investor about six, seven, eight years ago, where I can actually sit on both sides of the table, understand both parties, what's in it for them, where the risk comes in, which we can mitigate. And we built an ecosystem inside the incubator accelerator where both thrive, right? It's a supply and demand issue. Uh, very similar to Uber, Airbnb. If you take Uber, if you only have riders and no drivers, it's not going to work. If you only have drivers and no riders, it's not going to work. Airbnb, the same thing. If you don't have any guests, it's not going to work. If you have no supply, it's not going to work. So you have to keep a perfect balance between supply and demand. Supply are the deals, uh, the demand of cash. You got to match the two together, right? So that being said, we are very, very specific in what we're bringing on. Number one, we're only pure tech. We're, we don't do anything else because that's what we know. We don't want to reinvent ourselves. Number two, we look at founding teams that have been able to prove a concept, a POC, to have at least a simple POC where if they're, let's say, a mobile app, come to us and prove to us that you've been able to acquire a few downloads on your own. I'm sorry. And what's... If for those of um, POC, what does POC stand for? Proof of concept. Okay, proof, the proof of, of concept. concept. All right, right? Sorry. So, two things. Number one, operationally, show me that you have a product works more or less. Yes, it may be improved, but at least you get something. It's not just a vague idea. You're not just walking in like we all have. We have 50 ideas a day, and okay, I got an idea. Uh, sorry, I can't help you. Got a whole right? whiteboard with ideas. Uh, right, <laughs> just right. <sits> there. <laughs> you know, ideas are like a, I like like a holes. Everybody's got one, right? That's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thing, okay. Yep. So, secondly, if you're raising money, prove to me at least that you've been able to convince your grandmother to give you 100 bucks, right? Or whatever it is, okay. But at least show me some resilience. Show me some grit. Show me some persistence that you've been able to get some points on the board on your own before you come and see us. Assuming everything checks out, you got product market fit, your, your, your product makes sense, now, now, now I'm hearing you out. You've given me your hook point, your elevator pitch, your one sentence, your three sentences, and I'm still there. Okay, give me your one paragraph and maybe I'll hear you out for a half an hour eventually, right? Then in terms of what makes us decide to actually bring them under, under our helm, under our umbrella, the first thing we look at is how quickly we can add value to the deal, assuming everything checks out. Right, it's not just the cash. If I just want to be, because we're not passive investors, we're very, very, high, we're actually hyperactive investors. We want to bring you in and give you full support from legal, from accounting, graphic design, development, whether web or mobile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, digital marketing, customer acquisition, right, to carry you through A to Z and be your partner in that deal. So in many cases, for example. When customer acquisition and media comes into play, we also become the media investor in the deal, where uh, you don't have to go through the trial and error. You know, we've done 1,500 campaigns. Uh, no guarantee that we actually will succeed, but I can probably tell you what it is you need to do to not fail or to fail as quickly as possible, right? Uh, and then there's some just basic checks. Uh, one of the first questions I'm asking myself, even though I haven't fished in 25 years and I've been a veg vegetarian for 22, is would I go fishing with that guy? or with this team? In other words, would I seclude myself for a longer period of time, let's say one week, and would I feel comfortable? Would we have fun? Would we engage, et cetera, et cetera? Or would I get really bored, or these guys would really get on my nerves after two hours, right? If the answer to that is they would get on my nerves, I wish them the best. I may refer them out to somebody else, but I want nothing to do with it. Life's too short. Uh, I know I'm not gonna be motivated. I know I can't do a great job for them either. Right. So you really need to hit it on high cylinders at every single level. Yeah, I agree 100 percent with that. I mean, you know, with the clients that I take on, I mean, I worked hard enough where I can actually pick and choose who I want to work with. And I'm telling you, it's a great uh, it's a great thing to have, like a great advantage to have, because now I can see like, you know what? I like them. I like their company. We get along. We understand each other. We're on the same page. And, you know, working with a, with these clients where, where you actually Again, you can pick and choose with somebody you can, you, it's a good fit. It makes a, a world of a difference in campaigns and the way everything's managed. So I can completely understand where you're coming from for now. You got plenty of time in this business to be able to do the same. So, uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I, I've seen 
you know, big companies that, that, you know, I've done consulting with and, you know, we've done, I've done things with, and sometimes I sit there and they got, they have, you know, uh, they've gotten, you know, uh, seating rounds and all that good stuff, some money from VCs. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, that's when like the whole like gambling thing comes to mind. It's like, who <laughs> gave you all this money? Like who gave you all this money? Because you have no clue on what you're doing, you know? And, and it's, it's just, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me that, I mean, I don't think it's, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's as crazy as it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, where it, it seemed like everybody was just handing money left and right at any, you know, half dimwit idea that was out there. You still, I, you still, I mean, you still get some of that, some of that irrational exuberance. You still get it occasionally, but uh, there's a lot of smart money out there. Right, they know how to cut through deals, especially if you're looking at the VC world. Before they invest in a deal, they already got an acquirer lined up. They already got their exit strategy built in, so they invest at a low valuation, knowing that company B is going to make an offer for it, and they're sitting on the on the board of company B can actually make that happen literally overnight. Right, so I'm putting my chips on the table today. Speaking of gambling, but with a guarantee that I'm going to hit a home run a four, five, 10 X on that investment within six to 12 months sometime. That's amazing. But what happens if the, if the company goes under before that though? I mean, you and still it goes back to your 80, 20 rule you mentioned earlier, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you invest into 10 deals knowing that, you know, I would right. say seven will fail outright. One of them will trade sideways. One of them will do, will do pretty good. And the other one, the last one is going to be a home run. Yeah. No emotion involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, the other thing, since you're in this world uh, that I've noticed in the past uh, three years, and I, I even got a couple of videos on this because I've been trying to get my hands you know, dirty with it, I just don't have enough time, is the no code movement that um, you know, all these tools are coming out where you don't even you know, need to know how to code. But if you have a great idea, you can literally grab all these tools. Some of them are mm. free, some of them you have to, got to pay for them. And it's not like we were talking about, like it used to cost $32,000 to build a site. Like you can actually create an app a working app in literally a matter of hours. I've seen people create apps in a matter of hours and then sell them or monetize them somehow. It's insane to me that, you know, how far technology has moved forward where people can actually do this and then come to someone like you or your firm and be like, listen, I have this idea. I have thousands of subscribers are paying $29.99 a month. If we get X amount of money, I know we can grow it with marketing, email, blah, 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 blah. Have you seen like a spike of people taking advantage of, of that right now? For sure. I think we're still in the infancy of it. And what we're going to see that's going to be accelerating that, that, that pace is obviously AI, where you know the note code movement is actually going to go exponential within the next few years where you know you think of an idea and the ai will do the rest will actually build you the app will build you the website etc cetera, etc cetera. there are some early iterations of that already on the market i think what it does is it will in in a, in a large sense commoditize anything that's development related which is a process that has started already obviously the same way for example web hosting has been commoditized over the last 20 years used to be extremely expensive now it costs next to nothing uh, programming is going the same route very, very quickly. And what it will do is it will basically be a dawn of a new age of the digital marketers, of the guys who understand growth hacking, digital marketing, and taking the next level. And maybe once the AI is smart enough, it will disrupt us as well. And we just watch baseball or whatever all day long, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, we're seeing that, you know, we're getting like yeah, universal income uh, for everybody, you know, and then... Yeah. You, you start with a couple thousand a month and then eventually you have 20,000 universal income and you try to do something better with your, li with, with your life, right? I mean, what we don't realize is how fast all this is happening, right? And it's a snowball effect where over the next five years, the progress we'll be making as mankind is not happening in a linear fashion. You know, we're going to make more progress in the next five years than we did over the last 100 years, right? Because the pace of change and of progress is vastly accelerating, no matter which domain. Health is one of them. Figure COVID. How long would it have taken 20, 30 years ago to get a vaccine? Oh, God. It would have okay. taken us 15 years. Yeah, we'll right? be at dead very, right now. Yeah, exactly. At the, at, at the very least, 15 years it would, it would have taken us. And it's only because of the internet, of the, of the ability to exchange. Like keep, in, keep in mind, there's still on the biotech side a lot of walled gardens where you have the Pfizer's, BioNTech's of the world, you get the Merck's on the other side, et cetera. And you know, a lot of IP that's heavily protected. 
But even with those big companies, they have their scientists as we speak on those types of conferences, whatever it is, whatever platform they're using, instantly sharing concepts, blueprints, et cetera, et cetera, which would have taken F FedEx, right? Right. Two, two or three days to deliver, and then it was paper, right? Yeah, and now you can, you know, you send an attachment that's at the speed of light and it's already being reviewed in Brazil or who knows where, right? Right. So, I mean, that pace is not slowing down, it's accelerating. And that's why I'm a firm believer in what some people call the singularity, which, according to some pundits, will happen between 2030 and 2035, which basically describes the merger of human biology with technology. At that point in time, there's obviously going to be all sorts of ethical issues and philosophical issues to be raised. Do we want to merge with technology and become bionic, or do we want to stay biological, right? I made that decision a long time ago. Most people, as they get older, like, for example, I'm wearing glasses right now. I wasn't wearing those glasses six months ago, right? So you have to ask yourself, would I rather have be old and decrepit and half blind, or would I, like, would I prefer to have eagle eyes? You know what? I'm not sure about you guys, but I want eagle eyes, right? Listen, Pre you're, you're preaching to the choir here. My wife, it's old school, and she's like, I don't, when I die, I die. I don't want anything to do with any of that. And I'm like, listen, I want, she's, a, she's an attorney. I was like, I want this in her will. Like, if something happens to me, you keep me alive as long as you can, so you can download <laughs> my brain somewhere because it's going to happen. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, every, it's everybody's prerogative, right? So I'm not judging anyone, right? Yeah, but don't, yeah, no, tell me what I be, don't tell me what I should be doing. Because no, it's right. my prerogative as well. And yeah. the second thing is, look, my, my parents are 81 years old. And my mom's been dying for the last 30 years. She said, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going downhill, et cetera, et cetera. But I said, here's the test. Mom, if I ask you today, do you want to die today or you want to stay alive today? I want to stay alive. So I'm asking you the same question tomorrow. Do you want to die today or you want to stay alive? I want to stay alive. Okay? Because they're looking somewhere in the future, right, in something nebulous. But if you're asking concretely in the present, do you want to stay alive or you want to die? Everybody wants to stay alive. Yeah, Unless so. they're just in horrendous pain, have cancer or whatnot, where you just want to pull the plug. Right. But for everybody else who's not in that situation, they want to stay alive. So assuming you want to stay alive, would you rather be in good health or in bad health? Would you rather be blind or would like would want to see? Would you rather be in a wheelchair or would you rather walk? Yeah, the choice is pretty simple. Because I think the big mistake that we're making is that we when we think about getting older, we already think about automatically think about getting old and decrepit, suffering, right? But it's not happening that way. Technology allows us to extend the healthy years and push them out, uh, you know, to 120 years, 150 years, and beyond, right? And that change is happening as we speak. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, the older I get, obviously, I start thinking about like, oh my god, like I'm halfway through my lifespan. If you really think about it, you know. And then I think about my parents. You know, they're in their 60s. And it's like, man, I hope they make it like a good older i mean they're in good health right now but it's like another 20 years because in 20 years i mean the possibilities who knows where we'll be at i mean i know where it's going but it's just a matter of like you know are we going to be able to reverse age to a certain point yeah, so i mean there's a very interesting book that came out let's say 15 years ago uh one of my favorite writers ray kurzweil and terry grossman whom i met several times in person at his clinic in, in colorado it was called Fantastic Voyage, How to Live Long Enough to Live Forever. And basically what that book does, it describes the three stages in super longevity. Stage number one is the stage that we're all familiar with is biology, is us today, and right in flesh and blood. Stage number two, which started already 20 years ago, is biotechnology, right? Biotechnology allows us to extend lifespan, okay? live longer and healthier life. And finally, stage number three, nanotechnology, where you can really rebuild the body from the ground up in the little building blocks. You can have nanobots, which already exist in the lab, that scour your bloodstream looking for cancer at a first inkling of a cancer cell. It would zap it on the fly, on, on, on the spot, right? Because the big thing is, if you have cancer today, and you die from it, it's because there's no early detection. You've been incubating inside your system for 20, 30 years sometimes. And by the time it manifests itself, it's too late. But with new technology, you'll be able to, to, to figure that out instantly. The first cell that appears, boom, here it's gone, right? And you'll never get sick. 
And that's true for anything. You can actually rebuild the, the body cell by cell using nanotechnology, which is really on the upswing right now. And there are a lot of nanotech companies right now that with crazy market caps that are only focusing on human longevity. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I've been keeping up a little bit with it and, and with biohacking and all that good stuff. Like there's a bunch of companies, you know, where you can edit the code, uh, the DNA code sequence yeah, or whatever. Christopher. Yeah. Yeah, to, to make all those changes. I, I mean, I'm all about it, uh, you know, but again, I just had my first kid. And even if I had the choice, I was like, all right, what do you want to like, you know, it's just so weird to me. It's like, okay, what do you want? I was like, listen, I just want him healthy. <laughs> just let the genetics yeah. do its thing because I don't want to choose the way he looks or how tall or any of that, but just healthy. That's the only thing I choose. But what scares me with that too, it's like, you know, what's going to happen? Are we going to have all these crazy parents who like, you know, like sports fans, like I want my kid to be seven, five, so they can play in the NBA. You know what I mean? Like that's a very, it happen. no, it will happen. I mean, yeah. Obviously, you're gonna have some scary stuff, right? That's mm -hmm. that's gonna be. I mean, scary to the human mind in terms of what we can envision, because anything that is dramatically different to what we're accustomed to seems scary, right? Yeah. Uh, terms used today would be, for example, freak show, right? When you, we all know what comes to mind when we say that, right? But the thing is, I think we're also going to be evolving uh, on that side. But you know, uh, human brain is two hundred fifty thousand years old or so, so you're not going to change it overnight. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite books I ever read. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself. Uh, if you ever want to read a book that uh, will mark you, for me, it's a top five book I ever read, written by a famous neuroscientist called Norman Doidge, D-O-I-D-G-E, for those of you who are interested. And basically what it describes is that during the vast part of the, as the history, we've always considered the human brain, the adult human brain, as fixed that it could no longer evolve like concrete, right? Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's absolutely false. So for example, historically, we've always said that if you have a car accident and the right hemisphere of your brain is injured, the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and vice versa. So you'd basically be paralyzed on one side of the body, which is true. However, what he's proven in his lab with his patients is that he can actually rewire the brain and teach the right part of the brain to take over control over the right type of right part of the body, which everybody had believed was not was not possible. So Superman, Christopher Reeves, severed spinal cord, paralyzed in the waist down, right? If he hadn't gotten an infection, he actually started wiggling his toes by rewiring his brain just shortly before he passed. People had never seen that. All the specialists thought this, this doesn't exist, it's impossible. But what he had done is he had completely rewired his brain to take control over that part of the body. That's which had never been done before. So there, he goes through a lot of a lot of his patient uh, stories, and I think it's you'll definitely, in some chapters, you know, feel like he's talking to you because we've all gone through some stuff. It's an absolutely fascinating book, and I think it will help everybody kind of like look at themselves for who they are versus who they want to be. And uh, I think after you read the book, you'll live a happier life. Oh yeah, I wrote down. That's that's why when outside the camera, I was like, I'm writing down the both books that you mentioned. Um, I, I'm I'm so enjoying this conversation. But let's let's. I know we're we're short for time, but let's talk a little bit about the the startup Super Cup. Um, what is it? How did it start? It let's let's go into that a little bit. So as I mentioned, we're in the southwest of France in a small town of nine thousand people, three million tourists a year. It's definitely not, at least before our arrival, was never looked upon as a place where you would start a tech startup, let alone an incubator. A lot of tourism, a lot of great food, a lot of great wine. Uh, that describes France in general, but our area more particularly. Uh, what we've done is we basically, you know, the saying is the pioneers take the arrows, the settlers take the gold. Uh, we want to be both the pioneers and the settlers, but we were the first to actually set up shop here. Uh, we went from zero to 30 collaborators in literally no time from 18 different countries, mostly female, by the way. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in diversity, I don't believe that diversity should be dictated from the top down. It just happens naturally if you do the right things, 100%. if you look for the right kind of talent. Uh, last thing I want somebody is tell me what to do. I think you're probably the same kind of guy, yeah. right? I shy away. And everybody else is the same, right? No, you have to only hire men. No, you only have to hire women, you know? Well, F you, you know? Yeah. Who the hell are you to tell me what I'm supposed to do? That's how I feel, right? So by iteration, we've been able to attract an amazing pool of talent, which comes from all over the world. And now we're in a position 
where we're quickly expanding into 2,500 square meters of space, making us the largest rural incubator in the world. And we came up about six months ago with the concept of the Startup Super Cup as an event where startups meet capital. So on October 1, 2, and 3, which is a Friday through Sunday weekend of 2021, eight months from today, we will have a 1,000 people present over a three-day weekend consisting of 800 angel investors, roughly 80 early stage and seed funds, 100 startups pitching to them, and over 100 media outlets that cover startup business, uh, the economy in general, major name brands. I don't want to announce them yet, but those of you who register on Startup Super Cup, you'll get the newsletter. First one just went out a couple hours ago. And then we'll have a grand prize for an overall winner. And we'll have multiple prizes for each category winner. The part of the grand prize is actually going to be a unique trophy of a unicorn. That's my last awesome. name in German. My last name in German, Einhorn, means unicorn in German <laughs> as well. Awesome. So it's got a dual meaning. When I go to a German tech conference, the first thing people ask me is, "When did you change your last name?" <laughs> 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 so it's pretty funny. I have that, that that unequivocally happens every single time in Germany. So the trophy that we're going to have is going to be produced by a world champ chainsaw artist so it's going to be in wood it's going to be a wooden unicorn that he will carve on the spot that's so and that's cool. that's going to be the trophy uh so a lot of fun but you know the idea behind the event itself and you'll see more information on startupsupercup.com the idea was to cement this little town in the south of france as literally the epicenter for early stage startups to thrive. And what we realized is that we got way ahead of time before the event, I get 50 to 80 decks a day. I get 15 to 20 angel investors and funds contacting me every day just on LinkedIn alone. I can only imagine. Uh, because we got a lot of, uh, lot of media, local media, international media, et cetera, and this has taken a life on its own. That is amazing. So when you're getting all those, uh, so many people hitting you up at once, well, I guess you you can just steer into the startup super cup and it's like, Hey, here's the information. And you know, I can tell you the funnel guy. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking, it's like, how am I going to follow these people? Well, <laughs> not only photos, I'm just thinking just how to divert the traffic to what I want. <laughs> you, know what I want to, you know what I mean? That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. So, so I mean, we, you know, for the ones, the startups that are coming in, I'd say 50% of them go straight to trash. Yeah. And that's just a matter of proper etiquette, right? Don't say hi, at least say hi, Dom, for example, right? Or not say anything at all, or just don't send me just a PDF attachment without even knowing who, you know, yes, I can click on your profile, but at least give me a little bit of an intro. Yeah. Show that you've actually read a little bit about me and a little bit of respect that you you know what I like and what I don't like. Right. Otherwise, I'm not just going to waste my time. Yes, I may miss out on the next Airbnb by doing it this way, but I can live with that. All right. Yeah. So that's the that's the early filter. And then we obviously have an intake process where the ones that sound somewhat in line with what we're looking for get passed along through the filter, our own internal funnel. Right. And then we engage with them. And I would say one out of 10, we actually have a conversation with. And uh, sometimes it leads to people actually relocating here. So, for example, we were contacted a few months ago by a small startup in Rennes in Normandy called Ochi, O-C-H-Y, and was started by husband and wife, uh, former pro athletes, track and field athletes. Wife is French, husband is Jamaican, which means he runs faster than she does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very interesting concept. Basically, there are 650 million competitive runners in the world, and they all have two problems. Number one, they run the wrong way. Number two, they get injured by running the wrong way. This platform solves both problems. It's an AI platform where you upload a video of yourself for 15 seconds running. It will analyze the connecting points between the position of your head, your shoulders, your elbows, your knees, your ankles, etc., and will make a calculation on the fly as to how much you deviate from a perfect runner, whether you're a sprinter to a long distance runner, give you some immediate corrective measures. And then speaking of funnel, we're actually working on a, obviously level one is a freemium level, 
where we, where we get drawn in, there's going to be a light version or a light pay level with more information all the way down to a premium level where a coach, a professional coach will actually help you. That's so awesome. I literally have goosebumps just listening to you because I, I love everything that's tech. <laughs> I, I really do. I really do. I mean, I always joke around that, you know, I wish I had the creativity to come up with something, you know, I, a fantastic idea like that. It's just, I don't know. I just haven't had it. And it's just, I'm more in the executing side of things. It's like, okay, you have the idea. I, I'll make shit happen. You know what I mean? By, by putting the, the pieces together. But when I hear ideas like that, and you know, that's why I'm so uh, obsessed with the early nineties and the early two thousands. And you know, when all these companies came up, like, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, I mean, I've must've watched, I don't even know how many interviews with Jeff Bezos, you know, where he talks about how he came up with the idea and you know, how he got the money and, and I always learn it's one of those things that, yeah, you can have the idea, but it's also a matter of where you're at in time and who's around you. And, you know, it's, it requires a tiny, tiny little bit of luck as well. It's like, you know, maybe the person that gave you the money was, you know, in your network somehow. And that's how you got the first round or whatever. It's hey, like, whenever. Hey, yeah. Jeff Bezos parents, right? Yeah. And uh, they made up pretty well. I'll yeah, <laughs> talk about a good investment, 350K, and he just banged yeah. it out. But see, people don't realize, I mean, obviously, he's super smart, too. He was working for a hedge fund at the time, so he had all the numbers in front of him of how everything was growing online, and he's just like, hey, what's what sells the most? CDs and books, and then it's like, boom, that was yeah. Amazon. But most people don't know that that doesn't happen overnight. Everybody sees the success but not what it took to get there. Same with Facebook. I mean, Facebook was the sixth social media platform at the time after uh, yeah. Friendster and Six Degrees oh, of yeah. Separation and MySpace and some others, I can't even remember the names. And it wasn't an easy road as people think. It took a lot of work and expanding and playing the game. And you know, it is what it is today. They own the world pretty much too, but it's crazy. So there's that. Listen, Dom, I hate this, man, but we're out of time, but where no can worries. people find you? I mean, links, anything sure. you want to send them yeah. to? So easiest way for me, LinkedIn, Dom Einhorn, D-O-M, last name E-I-N-H-O-R-N. -E I'm the only Dom Einhorn on LinkedIn, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, website, unicorn with a Q, unicorninkubator.com. Email, same thing, Dom, D-O-M, at unicorninkubator.com. Uh, also, am the largest shareholder of the local rugby team, for those of you who like rugby. Uh, Sala Rugby, S A R L A T Rugby.com. Uh, and for those of you who do not know rugby, think of American football without protection. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> that's what I call the, the real athletes, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, it's like these guys, like I wouldn't mess with one of these guys, you know? Yeah. So I have seven of them work, working for a here. I'll leave you with this. I have seven of them working with us at Unicorn. Uh -huh. And it's pretty funny because it's. The world the other side around if i don't slap them around at least once a day <laughs> they, they they think they think there's something wrong with me <laughs> like like i'm mad at them or something <laughs> at least, I, I had one guy tell me at least hit me over the neck or something and i know you're okay that is so crazy man <laughs> um, thank you very much obviously guys i will have all the links in the description so you guys can find them and you can check out the, the start of super cup unicorn all that good stuff Dom. again i i so enjoy this conversation hopefully i can have you on again at some point um and then i got some of the rugby guys on you're gonna have a hoot yeah there you go hey <laughs> to Europe, uh last year and then freaking pandemic happened so we had to cancel our trip i was gonna go to france for a little bit too so well, now you have a reason start up yeah, I have a reason. so no we're doing the trip hopefully hopefully uh this year so you know when we go over there I'll, i might shoot you a quick message or email if we're passing through you know to check it out and maybe have a glass of wine or something absolutely My all treat. right Dom, thank you so much, man. Thank and you so much for having me. Till next time. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.